Welcome to Food Psych, a podcast about intuitive eating, body positivity, and health at every size. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm a registered dietitian, nutritionist, and certified intuitive eating counselor specializing in weight-inclusive wellness. Join me as I talk with interesting people from all walks of life about their relationships with food. Uh I I, I remember I was teething, little gums bleeding, Friday evening, it was all about eating. When I became a teen, it was all about beef, and now I'm ready for the world. Trying to sink my teeth in, stacking it. Hey there, welcome to episode 92. I am your host, Christy Harrison. This is Food Psych Podcast. And today I'm talking with the wonderful Fiona Sutherland, who's a fellow Health at Every Size dietitian based in Melbourne, Australia. So going around the globe here to talk to someone who I've actually become friends with through the Health at Every Size and non-diet world. It's kind of amazing, the power of the internet. So it was lovely to catch up with Fiona and have a deep dive into her history with food and how she got into doing the non-diet and health at every size work. And I can't wait to share our conversation with you in just a moment. If you can't tell, I have a little bit of a cold, so apologies for that, but I will not have a cold in the conversation that's coming up. Before we get into that, though, I just want to share a couple of resources for helping you make peace with food. The first is my free quiz to assess your relationship with food. And when you take the quiz, I'll send you individualized tips to help you make peace with food wherever you are in your journey right now. Take the quiz and get your results today at christyharrison.com slash quiz. That's christyharrison.com slash quiz. The second thing I want to share with you is my intuitive eating fundamentals course, which you can find at christyharrison.com slash course. It's a 13 week online course to help you make peace with food and learn to trust your body. Again, we work through all the principles of intuitive eating in depth and help you really troubleshoot everything that typically comes up for people as they're going through the principles. And it's all informed by body positivity and health at every size and size acceptance. So that's really infused throughout the course, um, as well as self-compassion. That's a huge foundation to what we're doing in the course because self-compassion has been shown to really help people make positive changes in all aspects of their lives, whether it's through relationships with food or anything else. So you'll learn all about self-compassion and about body positivity and health at every size as you're working through the principles of intuitive eating. So that you'll really end up with an understanding of intuitive eating that doesn't turn it into another diet or that isn't sort of pseudo body positive. You'll really be able to integrate the foundations of health at every size and size acceptance into your work with intuitive eating from the ground up. Just listen to what one of my participants recently said about the course. She said, I've been on an unofficial diet for over 14 years, and my goal was always to make peace with food in my body before I turned 30 because I don't want to have my children going through the same as me. With this course, I finally feel this is possible. It gives me hope. It challenges my thoughts. It provides me help when I need it, and there are a lot of journal exercises that I truly enjoy. I'm thankful for being exposed to another anti-diet world, and I definitely see meal plans and weight loss apps through different eyes today. I can't say how grateful I am that I found this course, Christy, and all the members who support me daily through our Facebook group. So that was Julie, one of my course participants, and I'm really grateful to her and to everyone else who has given such great feedback in the course. If you want to join her and many other participants in the course and become a part of our exclusive Facebook group, you can find out more and sign up at christyharrison.com slash course. That's Christy christyharrison.com slash course. Finally, if you like the podcast and want to help us reach more people, you can do that by sharing, subscribing, and reviewing on iTunes. So if you go to your iTunes podcast app, the little purple app on your phone, type in food psych to the search bar, click on the result that comes up under ratings and reviews. You can leave your rating and review there. And you can also share the podcast there by just clicking on the three dots next to the episode and then choosing share episode from the menu. It really helps us out when you share and review because it helps get the word out about the podcast to more people, helps other people discover these body positive messages when they're searching. So help out your fellow humans by leaving a rating and review and by sharing with friends. All right. So now without any further ado, let's go talk to Fiona Sutherland. I spoke with her via Skype from her home in Melbourne, Australia. So tell me about your relationship with food growing up. Gosh. Okay. So it's only over the past probably, you know, five to 10 years that I've really given some thought 
about the way I related to food and my body growing up. And I think this was through the process of supervision as a dietitian, like the world's best space for self-reflection, of course. And it was through giving myself the time and space that I really figured out that there was lots of influences in my life with regards to the messages that I was given around food and eating and not only my body, but then the bodies of other people. So I'll tell you a little bit about my direct experience and then I'll tell you a little bit about what I've discovered, if that would be helpful. Mm -hmm, Definitely. So my direct experience, if I was to just be really objective, would say I grew up in a quote unquote normal, (laughs) normal normal-ish family. I was the oldest of two girls. I am the oldest of two girls. We grew up in a lovely neighbourhood in suburban Melbourne. Life was nice. You know, we had our ups and downs as a family. We had our ups and downs with, you know, money and various kind of life issues like that. But really on the whole, I enjoyed a really nice, fairly uneventful childhood and adolescence. However, it's really interesting how I've got to this place and how I can reflect on the little things that all added up have had a significant influence on me. So, I come from an immediate family and from an extended family where there's a fair bit of size diversity. Not ethnic diversity, everybody is very Anglo, but all different kind of shapes and sizes. And it's interesting that My mum started dieting when I was probably about eight or nine. And look, to be honest with you, Christy, I thought it was just bloody ridiculous. You know, I thought, what, you know, why would you miss out on, you know, voluntarily miss out on eating these delicious foods? And yes, there was some language around it. There was some naughty and there was some good language, you know, oh, that's really naughty or I've been really good today. And at the time, to be honest, I didn't understand it. But looking back, there was a part of me that took that in. I took that in and it started building a story for me about food and about eating and about bodies. So as a child, I had a very, I I would have been regarded as having a small-ish body on the smaller side anyway. And so therefore I escaped any kind of body criticism from other people and definitely from my immediate family. However, my sister had, looking back now at photos, very average size body, but she was she was younger than me, but had a larger body than me as a child. And people were constantly thinking I was younger and she was older, purely based on body size. You know, didn't even bother to check in with us, really, which is what you really should do as a human. <laughs> But, yeah. um, you know, would, would make these assumptions about us. And that, for me, looking back now, affected both of us very, very significantly. What it taught my sister is that her body wasn't okay as it was. And it spoke very strongly to her that larger bodies are not as acceptable as smaller bodies in both subtle and not so subtle ways, sadly. And what it taught me was that there were certain bodies that were less desirable. I wouldn't go as far to say as undesirable, but there were certain bodies and people in my immediate family, my sibling, whose bodies were less desirable, who needed to, quote, unquote, watch themselves around food or, you know, buy certain clothes, or more buy not certain clothes. So, for example, in that era, it was, you know, oh, horizontal stripes were the enemy, you know. (laughs) Right. And, And black was your friend type thing. So, I saw all this and I heard all this. And even though I wasn't the direct recipient of those messages, I definitely took them in. Absolutely. And at the time, I would have said, oh, it hadn't influenced me at all. But it's only been through this amazing professional and personal journey of of having the enormous privilege of listening to other people's stories that's really 
encouraged me to do some really significant self-reflection and to think to myself, well, why is it that I feel so strongly about this field? Why is it that advocacy is so important to me? What is it about me that has led me to this point? You know, wh- why do I get so feisty and why do I get so upset about the way bodies are spoken about, about the way certain bodies are privileged? And so that was the start of it. Yeah. It was very tricky. I can see why that would plant the seed for you because once you get past the sort of just reveling in the privilege of that, I guess, right? Because there's a way in which I'm sure being the the one whose body was considered more acceptable, I think a lot of people experience this where they'll just go through life with that view and not question it or not challenge their privilege. But it seems like you had a certain empathy maybe towards your sister for what she was going through with this stuff? I think admittedly at the time, I didn't understand what it was. I certainly didn't have any language around it. And I think I, was, I wasn't I was emotionally mature enough to understand what it all meant and my place in it. And looking back now, I feel very regretful about some of my attitudes, not so much about things I I didn't say a lot, but I I certainly probably felt, in fact, not probably, I did, I felt a sense of smug superiority, which is, I mean, I feel very regretful about that. And I, and I, I feel, I just have compassion for myself as a child, really thinking, well, I didn't know any different. These messages were so strong about what a good body looked like. And then what a less desirable body looked like. And then there were messages about what you did or didn't do to either achieve or avoid those bodies, which is kind of step two, isn't it? It's like first the seed is planted and then it's like, okay, how do I avoid having an undesirable body? And that was it for me. It was like, how can I avoid it? And Luckily for me, I never personally went down the dieting route. That is lucky. Very lucky. There were definitely thoughts there when there were definitely desires to have a more desirable body, whatever that meant to me on any (laughs) particular day, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, You know, but I didn't engage in deliberate attempts to change my body. Isn't it interesting, too, how thin privilege often protects people from those attempts? It's like, I think that sort of awareness that there are, quote, more desirable or less desirable bodies, right, is is there for all of us. Like anyone in this culture kind of absorbs that in some way or another. And then the people who perceive themselves as being in that, you know, less desirable camp often get the added push to like, do something. Whereas maybe, I mean, for me, in in my experience, I definitely think looking back on just my family dynamics and, you know, the sort of fat phobia that was present in in my family, like if I had been in a larger body, I definitely would have gotten the message that I needed to, quote, do something about it sooner. So the only reason I didn't go to that step was just, even though I had the body shame, I had the feeling of like my body wasn't again, as desirable as it should be or whatever, but I was protected from sort of thinking to do something about it and like knowing what those supposed things were at a younger age because nobody told me I had to because my body wasn't what they saw as needing to change. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think that was the position that I was in. And yet my poor sister kind of copped the lot, really. So she was taken along to a big diet company, one of our, you know, kind of major worldwide, <laughs> worldwide <Yeah>. with um, <laughs> <laughs> emphasis on those letters, uh-huh. company, you know, to at 11. Mm. What the fuck? I mean, seriously. Yeah, I know. And it's so it makes me even thinking about it, even sitting here now, Christy, I can feel myself getting all hot and bothered because it just makes me so angry that my parent well my mum essentially god bless her who has admittedly she has changed a lot over the years in terms of the way she, her attitude towards bodies which is great to her credit but at the time it was like man no and and the body shame must have been incredible just in in just incredible 
So, and, and that was really, that, you know, just drove that message home of you don't want to feel ashamed, you don't want to be taken to this program, well then just keep yourself in check, my friend, that kind of thing. As though there was anything she could really do about it. I think that that's the the sad part of all this is like, you know, sort of a lack of awareness and respect for body diversity and size diversity leads people to believe that this is in their control. And yet it's just Sisyphean logic, right? It's just, you're just going to be pushing against this thing that's never actually going to move. Exactly. Exactly. And certainly her experience was that body shame led to that sense of disconnection that that you and I see all the time and we hear all the time in our clients' experiences. You know, at some point you switch off. At some point you tune out from our body's most natural signals and from listening to the wisdom that resides in it. Yeah, because you're told it doesn't have wisdom or that it's broken, right? Right, or that you can't trust it or that it, it should look different and you have to exert that force from the outside. Right. You know, i.e. dieting. Or yeah, keeping yourself in check. Right, exactly. It's so insidious. That sense of keeping yourself in check, I think, is so insidious because it's almost, well, it, it's definitely seen as a good thing. Mm-hmm. Right? That watch, just, just watch, you know, that the phrase of watch your weight. Right. Or... Yeah, so these things are, the language is almost commonplace and so normalized in a way that we don't kind of stop to just check that. Right. I know. It's considered just kind of like what we do. Like this is part of being a sort of sensible person as you police your body size or whatever. And I was just writing an email about this today to my email subscribers because I do like these little blog posts sort of emails about the latest episode. And I was reflecting on one of the recent episodes, my guest, Hillary Canavy, who we both spent some time oh, with recently. Yes. Fabulous. Was, I know. It was so great talking with her. And she was talking about how, you know, she grew up in a family of feminists who dieted and they didn't see the disconnect really between feminism and dieting and why why those things were sort of, you know, why dieting was antithetical to the values of feminism. And it was only sort of later in life that she was able to, you know, or in her, her 20s, she was able to kind of put the pieces together and understand the the disconnect there. But I was, you know, sort of reflecting on what she said, and I was writing, like, it feels like everybody just thinks of this thing that is so really barbaric and antithetical to a lot of people's core values of who they want to be, you know, which is diet, like dieting is antithetical to those values. And yet, it's just so commonplace and so de rigueur that it, it's not even seen as something you should question or challenge or anything like that. It's just it's just how it is. You know, for so many people, that's just how it is. And that's what people in larger bodies do. I mean, when you pull back from it and when you know kind of what we know now about dieting, it's almost like foot binding or some other barbaric ancient practice, right? That is you know, it's just like, how could people do that to themselves and think that that is normal and everybody was on board with it, right? You know, it's just so painful. And yet we don't think twice about it. You know, most of us coming up just don't think twice about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I like what you were talking about with the foot binding, because in a way, it's, if we were to think about what it is in another way, it could be soul binding you know diet just binds your soul binds your heart it binds that part of you that just wants to live and wants to thrive wants to connect so I really like I love that I think that's a nice parallel to make actually that it keeps us trapped oh I love the expression that Sarah Vance used expansion Mm, yes. I loved that when she spoke with you about that sense of expansion. You know, it keeps us from reaching out and literally and figuratively reaching out, but keeps us stuck, trapped, and yeah, really caught up, caught up in the idea that looking a certain way and behaving a certain way is a way to fulfill our worth and value as humans. Yes. Very well said. I like it's it's so true that we just kind of are bound by society, bound by tradition in a lot of ways mm. into that thinking, right? And it's it really takes a lot to be able to break through it and see 
a different way to go forward when what we're told from such a young age is like, well, just keep yourself in check and good people, basically, even if it's not said this way, it's like good people know how to Mm -hmm. maintain their body size or keep their body size from getting out of control, whatever that means. Absolutely. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. So it's so it's bringing it back to there's this message of your value and worth is tied up in your attempts to keep yourself in check type thing. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And it's actually then seen as quite radical, really, to push back. Yeah. And it, there's so much negative language about it too, like letting yourself go or, oh, yes. you know, that... And it's, it's the kind of language that's used to police any group that is trying to get rights for itself, right? I mean, over, mm. over history, mm-hmm. right? That seems like the parallels with foot binding or with any other sort of oppressive tradition are very striking. How, you know, people who give up dieting, like we've seen in the protest marches in the U.S. recently, you know, some of the negative comments from people in positions of power who want to keep women oppressed and keep the status quo, you know, just saying these awful things about protesters' bodies as a way to to shut it down, you know, like to silence them or to make them less than, you know, and it's like, okay, what that, when you sort of see between the lines of that, it's obvious what's going on there. It's not just about making fun of someone's size, but it's making fun of someone's size to keep them in a one down position. Absolutely. And and that's why I think when we when we can help people to find their voice and to help them see through those really they, those are cheap shots, cheap mm-hmm. shot attempts at shutting down conversation and, and silencing us back into a place where we feel like we should be controlling our bodies and you know in order to feel good enough then finding our voice is is a critical part of reconnecting with ourselves, reconnecting with our hearts, reconnecting with our souls, our values, and that deep sense of worth that resides within every single human being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and trust, right? Like being able to trust that that is within you and that is there for you to reconnect with, like for everyone. It's not gone, it's not lost, and your intuition is not broken, even though so much in our society tells us it is, right? That your failure to to look the way everybody wants you to look is actually not a failure at all. No, no, not at all. And to be able to unwind or unravel the deluge of messages that really we are thrown from a very young age, a lot of us from a very young age, it means that it requires a fair bit of time, effort and energy to be able to go back and take a look at, you know, wow, how, how have I got to this place and how can I rebuild my sense of trust and connection so that I can begin to nourish myself and to care for myself in a way that, that supports me to live a full and meaningful life. And I I talk a lot about radical nourishment, that idea that, you know, just simply feeding ourselves in a way that not only meets our needs, well, meets our whole needs, not just our physical needs, but then also our emotional needs and our desires for connection and our desires for pleasure. I mean, holy dooly, if, you know, if food isn't pleasure, then I don't know what it is, you know, (laughs) but we we get afraid of pleasure and we get afraid of meeting our needs in case, in case we let ourselves go or in case we lose control, but struggle for so many people. Yeah. And I think diets also sort of reinforce that because if you're dieting and depriving yourself, the body is very wise and it does Mm kind of know where it needs to be, you know, the, the size that it wants to be at and the nourishment that it needs. And when you restrict your food, it figures out a way to get what you need, usually Mm -hmm. often, Mm -hmm. right, through rebound binging. And so that binging that is created from dieting makes you feel like you're out of control. And especially, I know a lot of people who sort of demonize particular foods because it's like, oh, well, when I'm around that food, you know, I, I lose control completely. And it's sort of 
just reinforces this idea that you can't be trusted. You can't trust your body to make choices about food that are wise. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and certainly there are plenty of quote unquote experts around to help you, you know, beat your cravings or overcome your urges or things like that. So again, it perpetuates that message that desire and pleasure are things that are not to be experienced. And if you do experience pleasure, then, oh, well, geez, that's going to lead to you just eating all the food, right? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of the programs that were originally designed for addictions, more, you know, drug and alcohol that have, as you know, they've made their way into the food and eating sphere. And I'm not sure about you, but I'm I'm getting a whole bunch of people at the moment who have been involved in these groups for a length of time now. And are you seeing more people now? I don't know if it's more. I've been, I feel like it's been a pretty steady stream in the last few years. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, but you know, it's interesting because they'll come in saying they sort of knew they had a problem and needed help and and turned to a program like that and it just made things worse and so now it's finally mm-hmm. time which i feel like i've had a, a couple januaries in a row especially like mm-hmm. the wave of people mm-hmm. who are like okay i'm really going to address this now like the new year it's time to do something i feel like that's been when a lot of people come in and say okay i'm done with this program i'm ready to really address my eating disorder yeah absolutely yeah, it takes on a totally different – I mean, we, we do things very differently to the abstinence model, don't we? You know, we don't say don't eat this and don't eat that. And so, I mean, certainly everybody's different and, a, and the way that you would work with anybody individually really depends on what they're coming with. But, yeah, unfortunately that model is uh, – uh. <laughs> Does not work for food. I know. It's, it's, a, it's a real misapplication of – which, you know, for addiction, it certainly makes yes. sense, right, because there are chemical mm-hmm. – chemically addictive qualities in substances that require abstinence to be able to get a handle on. But with food, that's, it's not like that. Like even as I've, you know, spoken about on the podcast, we had an episode with Marcy Evans. That's um, right. Yes. Yeah. Where, you know, she was really helpful in in debunking the supposed evidence around food addiction. And it's really true that there is no evidence that shows food in and of itself and particular types of food are actually addictive substances, merely that they give us pleasure, right? That they light up pleasure centers in the brain. And what is demonizing pleasure, again, really kind of fits in with the diet mentality, right? It's more Mm -hmm. of the same that probably got a person to where they are feeling so out of control with food. So the solution is not more demonization of pleasure or more restriction. It's actually less. Mm -hmm. Well, like we were talking about before, it's that sense of sh- it, it perpetuates the idea of shutting off or shutting down as opposed to opening up and expanding and strengthening and broadening and, you know, all those, all those words that come with finding a greater sense of peace and calm around food and eating, you know, shutting, shutting down and silencing and binding is not going to lead to peace with food. No. Never. And I think it's, you know, when people sort of, it's different for everyone, of course, but I think if you can remember a time before there was dieting or before there was so much body shame, which unfortunately not everybody can. So a lot of compassion for people whose experience has always been that way, right? But I think for folks who did have a reasonably intuitive relationship with food at some point in their lives and then started dieting, I think it's pretty clear when you kind of, you know, and I certainly have done this for myself, like I can see now in retrospect so clearly that I never had any issues stopping when I was full of cookies or chips or cereal or any of the things that I demonized when I was in my eating disorder. I never had an issue with those foods until I started restricting myself of food Mm -hmm. in general Mm -hmm. and of those foods in particular. And then of course it was like, see, I'm out of control because I can't stop eating on these particular Mm -hmm. things. Right. But that was my body actually trying to get the energy it was missing from all the restriction I had been doing. And those foods are particularly appealing when you're restricted, right? There's right. Uh, yep. this drive towards carbohydrates in particular. And that doesn't mean that the carbohydrates are bad and should be avoided. That just means you're restricting yourself and your body's trying to get what it needs. And so maybe taking that broader view that it's not about 
you being out of control. It's about you being actually too much, you know, too tightly controlled or effort, you know, making so much of an effort to tightly yes. control your eating that is causing this rebound effect. Yes. Yes. Do you remember, Christy, when we spent some time together, we were speaking about the difference between holding on tight and letting go. Do you remember we spoke about that? Yeah. 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 And then during the week, I saw something on Aaron Flores, his Facebook, his professional Facebook page, which was exactly the same. And I was like, oh, yes, <laughs> great minds think alike. It's in the ether. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. And the idea of holding on too tightly to something, you can't see it. You know, you can't see the forest for the trees because you're hanging on so tightly. And that's the same as dieting or food rules or a- any kind of behaviours that have the perception of control. But the antithesis, really, unfortunately, it just promotes that idea that, you know, unless you're doing this, you you can't, you know, you, you can't control yourself, which is so hurtful and so, yeah, so damaging. But then there's the idea of you don't also have to throw it on the ground so that it rolls away from you, so you can't see it there either. But the idea of holding things gently so that you can, if you can imagine me holding a rock in my hand or something, and you can move the rock around, you can be flexible, you can be intuitive, you can still see it in front of you. So that's you, so you might be able to see some diet rules popping up for you. But when you see it and you're not crushing it in your hand, then holding with an open palm and being able to use your wisdom about choices, then it means that you can find space, space to make decisions that suit you or are a good match is usually a phrase I use that feel like a good match for you in that moment or at in that time in your life. So you're not throwing it away because a lot of people think are really afraid of, for example, the phrase letting go of food rules, whereas The way I explain it is, no, no, you don't have to throw it away. (laughs) It's more a holding gently so that you can create awareness of them and that you can have space for choice. And holding it gently is something that I know, well, you and I speak a lot about where you can just create that sense of awareness and create that sense of presence, which allows you to honour what you need right then and there. And look, the reality is that sometimes we make choices that might not be the best match. And it is, that's where compassion then comes in, you know. Mm-hmm. There's loads of times, even for me as a natural eater, I do, I call them oops. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those whoops, I, uh, whoa, I really, I, I stepped beyond my comfortable fullness mark there. Whoops, you know, or oh, geez, you know, that combination of foods just led to my belly feeling quite gurgly and a bit uncomfortable or, you know, led led to a headache or whatever the physical sensations may be. Whoops, you know, and that sense, you know, gives you, it just gives you spaciousness for compassion and it also gives you space to understand, oh, okay, so was there something that was going on there that led to maybe some mindless decision-making there? or some mindless eating? And if so, is there some adjustments I can make? Is there some modifications I can make? I don't need to beat myself up and say, oh, you know, good on you, you stuff that one up or blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I mean, that's polite. That's very. That's me being very polite. Right, right. You know I can swear. You oh, know yeah. this, Christy. <laughs> totally. You're welcome to swear on this podcast as well. It's Thank very. You. I appreciate that. I, and I know I can. Free speaking zone. <laughs> <laughs> the language that people say to themselves, I wouldn't dare repeat. Right. Yeah. Cause I think there's, there's so many horrible things we say to ourselves, right. That like, I almost, I, even when clients tell me stuff that's going on in their mind or whatever, I almost don't want to even repeat any of it back to them. Cause it just feels so punishing. Yes. So there we have reasons for spaciousness. <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. I think, you know, in terms of the the kind of like letting go and holding with compassion your own choices around food, it sounds like you've probably had to do years worth of work 
like we all have to get to that point, right? Like undoing the messages that you got. Because it sounds like you you got some messages around needing to hold things tightly and good and bad foods. And even if you didn't actively diet out of that, where do you feel like you were sort of stuck in the diet mentality still around or, you know, kind of constrained by it in terms of your choices with food? Well, I think how it appeared in my life was, I think, to be honest, a bit of weight bias, which is really, I mean, given where I am now in my life, is it's fairly embarrassing to admit, really. But I think that's how it arrived in my life as a child, and I think that stayed. I think I really took on that strong message of there are some bodies that are better than others or more desirable than others. And certainly during adolescence, it's pretty fair to say that adolescence is not necessarily a deep time of life, (laughs) Um, you know, and watching the more attractive girls get more attention and appearing to be more desirable. I think I was so busy. I, I was a gymnast as a teenager, so I spent so much time in the gymnastics hall training that desirability was not on my radar until my 20s, really. And I think it all caught up with me then. <laughs> but, um, you know, during my teenage years, I think that was not on my radar. I think I was just so focused on my sport. And But interestingly, it was a sport that focused on appearance and on body shape. And I, again, wow, so lucky not to get caught up in it. And as a gymnast, and this is just within gymnastics, I was an average size. I, I was not a small gymnast nor a larger body gymnast. I was kind of right in the middle, which again allowed me to escape criticism. So I wasn't kind of held up on a pedestal as idealized body form, nor nor was I criticized, overtly criticized. And certainly I have my coach to thank enormously, who was very, I mean, looking back now, she was incredible. She protected all of us from body criticism and from behaviors that could have been really harmful for us. She, I mean, to this day, she wouldn't, she wouldn't know. And unfortunately, she's kind of off the radar in terms of my life now. But one day I'm going to search high and low for her. And just because she's somebody who I think protected all of us. And I think that's really important for sports coaches to understand that there can be, there is, there is the stuff that you can do that can be harmful. And that stuff is fairly obvious. A lot of coaches are like, oh, I don't comment on bodies or I don't weigh them or I don't do skin folds or I don't do this and I don't do that. And that's great. Like, that's fantastic. Yeah. But there's also a whole bunch of stuff that you can do that actively can protect your athletes and that can strengthen them against our culture. And during those childhood and adolescent years, it's really finding any way of protecting ourselves against the culture that will continue to come at us from left and right, from top and bottom, anything, any skills that we can use, any of those messages that say your body is good enough as it is now, let's, you have strength, you have power, let's work on dynamic, you know, let's work on your dynamic or let's work on this particular way of doing, performing this routine or, or artistry or expression or musicality or anything that crosses any of those, you know, gymnastics, dance, ballet, any of those kind of performing arts slash sports. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's so valuable. What were some of the things that she said or – did that helped protect you? You know, it's interesting, Christy, because I think it wasn't so much what she said, it was how she was. And I've learned a lot from that. I really have learned that you can talk, 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 talk. And and what you say is definitely important, but how you are with your own body as a coach, as a parent, as a friend, as a community member is really important. The way that you role model the respect and care that you have for your body through time. You know, our bodies change. I've seen my body change a lot. (laughs) Childhood, not only childhood, adolescence to adulthood, but then I've had two beautiful children. So I've had pregnancies, which changes your body a lot. 
And I think cultivating that sense of a calm and strong and stable care and connection for your body as it changes is critically important because it will continue to change throughout life. I mean, heaven forbid, I hope I'm not super close to menopause. I deserve a break. After my (laughs) pregnancies, my body just needs a little bit of a break for the next, I hope, at least 10 years. I'm praying at least 10 years of stability. But I think if we're able to cultivate that in our younger people and young adults, then those changes, you can navigate those changes. Yeah, it's interesting thinking about that sort of trajectory throughout the lifespan reminds me of Margot Main's work. Yes. She talks a lot about women's bodies in particular and how they are sort of everybody's bodies always changing, right? But in our culture, it's like women's bodies are sort of pushed into this basically prepubescent box and you know we're that's what we're supposed to look like is basically a pre-adolescent girl. So when you go through puberty of course there, there's that natural process of weight gain and oftentimes in young adulthood too kind of like a you know reaching your sort of full adult size and Definitely. then through pregnancy and then menopause right there are all these significant changes that happen too and that you know our society really makes people, makes women vulnerable at those times, at those different stages of body change, because the message is not your body's going through something necessary and sort of magical and we need to have reverence for that. Like you're becoming a woman or you're becoming a mother or you're becoming, you know, you're transitioning out of your reproductive time and all of these sort of big markers in your life that could be seen as something to value and something to revere are actually just sold to us as a time to diet and try to change your body in a new way your body's going to betray you or whatever right when it doesn't have to be seen as a betrayal yeah and it it definitely sends that message of like we were talking about before exerting an external force on your body that you can't be trusted to look after yourself and that these there's something not right about these transitions and you need to I mean a post pregnancy or postpartum as you call it in the US is a very vulnerable time for women where I mean dear god I've had the experience of having a new life in my arms and you've got no idea what's going on <laughs> you've got no idea no. you're so um and it is magical and frightening and overwhelming and exciting and everything all at the same time. And that's just, and that's, um, I'm sure that's helped by the hormones raging, Mm -hmm. um, you know. (laughs) But at a time where women feel most lost and need the deepest connection with themselves, with their communities and with their own bodies, it's a time when they are preyed upon you know, get your body back, yummy mummy, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, you can hear it in my voice. I get, again, very pissed (laughs) off, you know, very upset. Yeah, it is, it is preying, really. It's preying upon women at this vulnerable state, which is terrible. I also feel very angry towards that type of messaging and marketing. Yeah. And I think a lot of people who send that message in marketing, there's part of me that wants to feel like they have women's best interests at heart, but I actually, there's part of me that thinks, no, you assholes, like, no, mm-hmm. no, 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 no. And a lot of, you know, maybe coaches or say fitness professionals or, you know what, Christy, even dietitians, even our colleagues, They feel that, well, if people come to us and they want to lose weight or they want to change their body or they want to do this, they want to do that, then our job is to help them. And I think during my career, and I think I've been saying I'm a dietitian for 15 years, for about five years. (laughs) So I'm I'm finally up to 20 years, which is, you know. (laughs) It's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I was about to say a bit frightening, but then I'm like, no, actually, no, that is, it's amazing. It It is. is It's a huge accomplishment. Yeah, thank you. So during during my career, I've I've noticed myself really change my tune about the way I work with people. And thank goodness for my beautiful, incredible and very brave clients over the years who have taught me basically all all I know really, their stories and their experience and their insight and their wisdom has helped me understand the human experience and has really made me 
the professional and the person that I am today. So that's why I am, you and I are both very passionate about working alongside our colleagues and dietitians. And that's why I, you know, freely go and talk to, you know, I mentor lots of dietitians. I go talk to them at university, dietetics courses at university level, because the value that we place on people understanding and connecting with their own experience needs to be privileged. You know, we need to prioritise people understanding their own experience rather than seeing ourselves as the experts. (laughs) That's a hard lesson. It is, and it's not something that's really taught in most dietetics programs or coaching programs or I mean I guess some some health coaching I guess has that sort of mentality of walking alongside but then of course there's all this messaging to the contrary as well like but don't eat gluten or whatever so yeah I'll walk alongside you but I'll be talking to you and giving you advice at the same time (laughs) right exactly (laughs) yeah so not quite the the sort of shepherding that might be really effective I'm curious like how your career started and and how you got to where you are what did that look like that evolution yes oh okay so let's go back to me as a dietetic student christy we know each other this will come as no surprise to you that i was not the most attentive student <laughs> and i would question my lecturers which 20 years ago That was not the thing to do if you just wanted to skate through and you wanted to pass and you wanted to do well. You did not question. Nowadays, things are a little different. And actually, I've got some friends who are very senior in dietetics programs and they actively invite the questioning from students. Look, some others others do not, which is a shame. But And certainly when I'm presenting at workshops, I I do invite questions because it's only through questioning that we learn and grow. But I'll give you an example. So I'll never forget this one day when back when I was a student, the the whole, the theme of that time was monounsaturated fat and soluble fibre. That oh, was the, yes. that was the, yeah, do you remember that? Mm-hmm. So, um, and I was like, boring. <laughs> when are we going to get to the good stuff? And do you know, for two years in my master's degree, Christy, we never got to the good stuff. We never got to it. It was, and I'm not disrespecting biochemistry and physiology and da 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 da. da. It's all essential. It is absolutely the the building blocks for dietetic practice. So I'm not disrespecting that. We really didn't talk about the human experience. We didn't talk about counselling. We didn't talk about people's struggles with food. We didn't talk about relationships with food. There was no such thing. Well, sorry, there was such a thing as health at every size, as I know it now, but I'd never heard of it. Yeah, it wasn't taught. No. Oh, my God. No, that would have been revolutionary. I would have been skipping around the lecture theatre and high-fiving everybody who came <laughs> within a foot of me, you know, Yeah. thinking, oh, my God. So as, even as a student, I knew something was missing. There was something missing for me. And I'm coming around to my story. I'll circle back. <laughs> <laughs> so. So I'll never forget, I was sitting, I even remember exactly where I was sitting in the lecture theatre. It was kind of towards the front, about three rows back, and my my lecturer at the time, he was a diabetes expert, and he was talking about replacing one style of fat with another style of fat. And I was thinking in my mind, yeah, what, like replacing, say, cookies with avocado? I was thinking, yeah, no, this is not going to happen. And interestingly, at that same time, my friend's father had been recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And I had him in my mind as this lecturer was speaking about, you know, how you would explain how you swap one for the other and suitable substitutes and, you know, all that really traditional dietetic kind of way of thinking. Anyway, I sat there and I put up my hand. (laughs) You know what's coming, Christy. And I said, so hang on a second, what about if your client or patient says, I don't want to, or I don't like that food, or I don't think I can do that, what do you do then? I thought it was a very sensible question. And to this day, I stand by that question. Great question. So important. Because that is the human experience, right? Like, you're not going to just eat an avocado instead of a cookie. That's not the same thing. (laughs) (laughs) I thought it was absurd. Yeah. Absurd. Anyway, and so do you know what he said to me? He said, Well, you're just gonna have to make them. They're just gonna have to do it. <sighs> wow. And it was then that was then that I was like, Yeah, no. 
no, 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 no. And so back then, I mean, now looking back, I give myself a big fucking huge pat on the back for going, no, no, that is not okay. And that was the moment that I was like, no, something here is not right. And it wasn't just about the substitute this with this. It wasn't just about the flavor of the moment with nutrition. It was something that I felt was so just critically not right. I will scoot forward and say, then I spent two years in clinical practice in the UK, which was great. And I kind of cut my teeth in clinical practice. But then it kind of it really did emphasize for me that clinical practice is just not, it's not my bag, not my bag. Five minutes here, 20 minutes there, two minutes here. I didn't get to speak with people. Connect. Right. It was. Yeah, you're seeing them as they're in the hospital for some other thing, right? And And just sort of doing a little drive-by about nutrition. That's right. Here, I'll pop in and give you this handout. What? Okay, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, and, and at the time it made me feel good, but was it helping my patients? No, sorry, it was not. So, yeah, it, it was, and it, it's only been with kind of professional maturity that I'm like, yeah, no, handouts, they might make me feel good, but they're not doing any good, really. So then... I spent another two years in Canada and I actually, because of the registration difficulties at that time between Australia and Canada, I couldn't work as a dietitian without jumping through a million hoops and all the hoops were on fire and the fire <laughs> was over a big canyon and it was impossible pretty much. So, so I took two years off and I taught outdoor education with teenagers in the Rocky Mountains just outside Banff. So I had a ball I still keep in touch with a lot of those people that I worked with at that outdoor education centre and that experience taught me a lot about people, about the human experience, not about food about and not about eating and not necessarily about bodies but just it, I really grew up. I grew up and matured a lot as a person. Was it like an outdoor education place for troubled youth or one of those types of things? Part of it was that, although I wasn't working on that program because I didn't have the experience. So we had on that program, there were social workers and outdoor education teachers and people who were actually really qualified, whereas I was a dietitian <laughs> <laughs> parading about as a, as a youth worker. No, I more worked with the young, younger kids, so maybe 11, 12-year-olds, and they would come in often for oh, five to seven days at a time, and we'd do outdoor education activities. We'd do hiking and rock climbing and environmental education, and it was awesome. It was so great. And plus, the environment in terms of you know animals and trees and shrubs and nature was completely different to Australia, of course. So none of it was familiar to me. So I learnt the difference between a fir and a cedar and a, you know, all that stuff. Right. Right. Anyway. Um, so, yeah, and I learnt the dangerous animals and that Canada has lots of dangerous animals. Oh, yes. And Australia has lots of dangerous animals <laughs> as well. And there's no escaping the dangerous animals. It's true. Yeah. So ours are spiders and snakes and sharks and crocodiles. And then in North America, it's bears and cougars and wolves and... Yeah, I like the big predators. It's not the little things that bite you so much as the big predators. Yeah, that's exactly right. Exactly right. So I digress. So anyway, took these two years off, grew up a lot, came back to Australia, and this is where the juicy stuff happened. So I came back I wanted to actually become a teacher then. I wanted to go back and do education and I didn't want to be a dietitian anymore. And my dad, God bless his resting soul now, at the time, just such a beautiful, lovely man, never really told me what to do. Very supportive of everything I did, picked me up when I fell, you know, brushed me off and said, come on, you can do it. It was always just a really lovely presence in my life. So um, he, uncharacteristically for him, literally sat me down and he said, yeah, I think we maybe let's have a think about this. And I was like, no, no, I really do want to be a teacher. And he's like, need I remind you about that big debt that you have <laughs> <laughs> from your dietetics and my science degree? And do you think it might be worthwhile giving a go, you know, trying to get a job as a dietitian? And then if you're still not happy in 12 months, then we can that not we, then you can, you know, sign up for an education program. And I thought, you know what, that is fair enough. I didn't, I didn't really listen to my parents tons up until that point, but there was something about the way that he said it that I thought it was probably the word debt that got me. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, you know what? 
okay, I'll go back. Anyway, found myself in a weight loss clinic. Christy, <gasps> oh, my oh God. no, oh, no. all the places, yeah. So it was horrific. But at the time, I knew no different. Still to that point, yeah. I was questioning, but I didn't have a language for it. So I found myself in this weight loss clinic. It was it was specifically a weight loss clinic, right? And I had person after person after person with very similar stories with dieting, body hatred, just completely disconnected from themselves and still I didn't have language. It was at that point in time that I very serendipitously, is that the Mm -hmm. (laughs) whatever that word is, luckily, yes, yes, serendipitously stumbled across Dr. Rick Corsman's book, If Not Dieting, Then What, which was written in the late 1980s and I didn't come across it, uh, or maybe early 1990s. I didn't come across it until around early 2000s and I read it and it was all non-diet stuff, all about intuitive eating. It was it was the first kind of Australian book that I had, first book, you know, full stop that I had come across. And I was like, oh, oh, and I had this massive, massive, I don't even know what to call it. I mean, if I was to go all spiritual on you, I would say it was an awakening. It was this realisation that this was the piece I was missing. This was the stuff that all along hadn't made sense to me and I didn't have words for it. And I and, and remembering at the time, I was working at this weight loss clinic. So what does any feisty, questioning person who's just had an awakening around non-diet do with this whole bunch of people in a weight loss clinic. I quietly shut my door and I practiced. I practiced doing all the non-diet stuff. I practiced asking the questions that I had just been dying to ask, but I thought I wasn't supposed to. And I really, after I'd probably, by this stage, I've been in that job for maybe three or four months. And by this stage, look, my my self-esteem as a dietitian, not necessarily so much as a person, but my sense of esteem as a and confidence as a dietitian was at rock bottom absolute rock bottom because I wasn't helping people and people and I knew I was hurting them I just in my heart I knew that this was not good but I didn't know what else to do anyway so started practicing and then I kind of saw the light and I got found out by my boss that I was doing this stuff yeah (laughs) I didn't go as far as to get fired. I made a hasty retreat, though. Let's put it that way. Made a hasty retreat. And then I, again, very serendipitously came across a job in eating disorders. Now, I didn't know eating disorders. And in fact, I was scared shitless of eating disorders. I thought we'd had two hours in university and it was all adolescent inpatient anorexia. So, yeah, that gave me a good idea about what eating disorders was, right? Oh, God, yeah. No, it scared me, really. So I got this job at an outpatient private practice for eating disorders, which at the time was called The Oak House. And unfortunately, it's shut down now, which is such a shame because that's where I really cut my teeth on eating disorders all across the spectrum, all different presentations, all different body sizes, all different complexities. And I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. Dietitians really aren't trained in eating disorders, right? It's it's something we kind of have to learn on the job or with continuing education. It's not not easy. So interestingly, it was only last week that I went into one of our big teaching universities here in Melbourne and I and I taught the I was given 2 hours to do eating disorders. <laughs> so these these students are about to graduate in 3 months. And so and they were looking at me wide-eyed and very curious and I did really nothing about I did nothing about the medical side of things. I just did diagnosis and I did early intervention and I and I did assessment. And that's that's pretty much all I did because I'm thinking, A, I don't want you to leave here thinking, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to work in that field because it's the most rewarding field you can possibly work in, I think. But I also wanted to equip them with the confidence and skills to know what they're looking at and to know how to refer on, to know how to access good treatment and to know the difference between quote unquote healthy (laughs) and where it slips over into more 
asphyxia type of presentations and how not to perpetuate that in our profession. So, yeah, I spent a lot of time in that private practice. And at that time too, I also started started in sports nutrition. So I was working in AFL, which is Australian Rules Football, which has the status of your NFL, very high status, very high performing athletes, lots of money, lots of sponsorship. Mm-hmm. Not me personally, of course. I didn't get the sponsorship or <laughs> the money, of course. But that came with a lot of responsibility. And I still to this day work at the Australian Ballet So I work, and again, I have this attitude of better in than out, let's make change from the inside. And I'm pretty proud of the work that we've been able to do at the Australian Ballet in terms of creating body positive environments and attitudes and setting up programs that help prevent any kind of struggles with eating. And we have early intervention programs in place. And yeah, so that's kind of led up almost until, well, led up until kids and then life changes. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Can't do quite as many side projects and various different things anymore, right? No, no. They are my main project and my work is my side project, <laughs> really. Right. Yeah, no, that's I mean, it sounds amazing though that you're able to create those programs and structures and places that people, I'm sure, are very vulnerable to disordered messages around food and disordered eating. So, Because I think really with sports nutrition, it can go either way so easily, right? Absolutely. It it really can because it's another subculture within our culture. So not only do athletes, regardless of whether somebody's an amateur or elite or professional, they grow up in our wider culture and then they also then train and live in a subculture, which often strengthens the idea of what a good body looks like within that particular sport. So, of course, athletes in different sports come in all different kind of shapes and sizes. So, even within, say, an NFL team, you know, depending on your posi- where you play, I, look, I don't know a lot of about NFL, but I'm guessing that it's similar to a lot of our team-based sports where even depending on your position on the field. So, some players may benefit more from being in a bigger body and some players may benefit more from being in a smaller, smaller body, you know, one that's more, one that moves really quickly or that has is really powerful. So, yeah, athletes, there's this extra layer of culture that, whoa, it's really tough. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I, didn't, I never thought about it quite that way that, like, there's that double whammy, basically, of, of living in our culture and then having this additional pressure that's sort of specific to the sport and to maybe sports in general as well, to some extent, because I think orthorexia, the sense of like being healthy is such a priority that's put on athletes, right? Yes. I think it's increasingly getting sort of tied up in in orthorexic attitudes, kind of no matter what sport you're in. Yes, definitely. And it's interesting that it all comes to the fore or you see it's more obvious. For example, when we have an Olympic year and then a lot of athlete bodies are on show really and then everybody decides you know to be an armchair commentator about bodies Uh, and athletes really feel that they feel critiqued and they feel that pressure and you know what's really interesting is I do work a lot with athletes who get themselves into a bit of a pickle around their body and around food and eating and so forth but I'm I work a lot I have a lot of clients who are post-career who it's then that they get into a bit of strife because that pressure that they have put on themselves to look like an athlete, to eat like an athlete, to live like an athlete, it's very hard to let go of and our culture makes it really hard. You know, an athlete that their peak is still meant to look the same way after they've been retired for five years what? No, yeah. <laughs> no, like, no. But it's really interesting when when I talk about this with coaches and with organisations that look after athletes post-career, I stress the importance of keeping an eye out for their relationships with bodies and food and eating because actually not dissimilarly to postnatally or postpartum, this is a very risky time 
because that loss of identity associated with being an athlete, that loss of collegiality through team, that loss of being part of a culture leaves people post-career athletes very, very vulnerable to disordered eating and actually to eating disorders, even if they've never struggled with an eating disorder in the past. So it's interesting and it's very troubling. Yeah. I've definitely known a few people who that's happened to, for sure. Somehow the sort of camaraderie and culture of the sport actually was protective in a way against developing those issues. And then, yeah, once the sort of threat of losing what they had, you know, losing the body they had, losing the everything sort of emotionally that's tied up in not being part of a team anymore, being performing in a sport anymore. It's like, that's when the the pull of disordered eating or changing your body becomes greater. Yes. Yes. And also the attention and praise from people as well. You know, if there's some worth tied up in people applauding you, applauding your body, applauding your performance, then when you're no longer getting that or getting that as strongly, then the pressure to build a sense of worth and value aside from your athletic persona or your athletic character is so tough because for a lot of, especially professional athletes, people whose whose lives are really caught up in, in their athletic career, they have really been athletes since they were kids. They've been picked up into talent programs very young they've gone into high you know high high end elite training systems so they that real sense of self is left behind even if they go on to coaching or even if they go on to something else it's a big gap in life and i find that's when people can sink into attaching to food or attaching to exercise or other kinds of behaviours that give, that offer a perception of control and, and worth and value. And, you know, of course it's a, it's a big illusion, but I don't blame people for looking for something, you know? Yeah, for sure. It's a way to cope and it's a big loss. There's these, I mean, somewhat in the same way with, with the life transitions we were talking about before with, you know, women's bodies changing. It's the same with, athletes or anyone I think who's who's having a major life change like a major career change a major change of scenery like setting and the people they're spending time with and the sort of identity that they're occupying it's it's tough yeah absolutely so yeah just trying to spread the body positive and health at every size message around as much as possible through sporting organizations and I like the idea of Hayes through stealth (laughs) yeah that you don't always have to be overt and loud about it you can role model it you can embody it and you can talk about it in ways that amplify and reflect the principles without you don't have to always give it a name and I think sometimes when you give it a name people are like oh what well, what's that? So I love Hayes through stealth <laughs> because it is it is health at every size and it is body positive, but you don't always have to call it that. You can just, you know, just be it. I love that. That's actually such a refreshing perspective because I feel like I've talked a lot on the podcast about not sort of straddling the line or trying, you know, not trying to do one foot in the anti-diet world and one foot in the diet world and sort of mixed messages and stuff. But I think there is there's that benefit of like being able to move in circles that you wouldn't necessarily be able to move in if you're really out about being health at every size and honoring the message there. Like how you started in the weight loss clinic doing anti-diet or non-diet approach work, sometimes you have to just start where you are, right? Like if you have a job doing something and you don't have any experience doing Hayes work, but you have this job at a weight loss clinic or this job at a bariatric surgery center or this job at a diabetes clinic or whatever it is, you know, why not start practicing where you are and see how it feels and see the benefits of doing that kind of work. And then you can always transition away as your commitment to Hayes grows if you want to be more sort of in that squarely rooted in the Hayes world, but you can also do so many different things, coaching, 
both athletic coaching and health coaching or whatever it is, you know, right from a Hayes perspective and not even have to tell people that. Yeah. I mean, you hit it in one when you said, you know, starting off with where you're at and not being afraid to go into communities which are not particularly, as we would say, body positive or not particularly haze friendly and not being afraid to go into those environments because, to be honest, I really believe that's where we can make the most difference. And yes, you're going to need a desk to plant your forehead on regularly to face palm. You know, you're going to need to palm your face regularly. You're going to yeah. need some space and maybe a glass of wine at the end of the day if that's your bag. But my own personal experience has, I guess, really illustrated that as much as I love, I just love my Hayes community so much because I am, I feel nourished. I feel nourished and validated and so wholly welcome within the Hayes community. So I love it. It's like a big warm blanket, you know. I feel so loved and accepted and, you know, and challenged at the same time, which is, you know, it helps me to grow and learn. And there's, I've got so much to learn, Christy. Oh my gosh. You know, still all of us. Yeah, exactly. Me too. But at the same time, you know, having the courage to step into those spaces and because there are a lot of very well-meaning, particularly health professionals out there who might be questioning or who might just simply, they don't know any different. They just don't know any different. And you never know who is going to be the person that is going to be open to that conversation. I've been shown Time and time and time again, the most surprising people have come back to me. So after I've written maybe a letter to a GP or after I've done a presentation or after I've done some supervision or some mentoring, the most surprising people have come back to me and have said, I read that piece of research. Can you tell me more about that? I didn't understand that or, oh gosh, I hadn't thought about it like that before. And that is how a movement expands and grows. I love it. I so agree because I feel like we can be, and we are now firmly rooted, both of us and anyone who's in this, the haze and body positive movement, right? Firmly rooted in this movement, but that wasn't always the case. Like we had to have our journeys, you know, and it's unfortunate that so many people have to have, you know, such a a lonely and like piecemeal sort of journey with it, right? Like that it's, that we're not just given a community right off the bat to teach us these messages. But I mean, what you're doing with educating students, I think is huge because that is introducing them at a time when it, it matters, you know, but anyway, you know, a lot of us come to this through these winding paths. And I'm sure even if Hayes were fully integrated into school training programs, that still people would have their winding paths with it, right? Oh, definitely. I, I just I just think that if they have at least even two hours, I mean, at, at one of the universities, I've got, I've got eight hours. I've got a whole Ooh. day with students, which is, I know, That's I'm amazing. so lucky. I, I, I know, I know how lucky I am. And I, and I just, I use every minute, every mm-hmm. single minute. <laughs> and I'm aware of how fortunate I am to have that. And at the other two universities where I teach, I've just got a couple of hours each. And I just, I, again, I just soak every single minute up and the feedback I get from students is that they really enjoy hearing about something different and I think at least if if students can be exposed to health at every size and non-diet or anti-diet kind of principles then at least at least they've heard of it Mm -hmm. you know and I think that's the start and if they decide that they want to investigate more then hopefully there are some great people setting up some really wonderful groups that are hoping to spread the message like RD for BC, you know, registered dietitians for body confidence.com. Is it .com? Yeah, I think it's RD for BC.com. Yeah. Dot com. So anybody who's a dietitian, jump on there, jump on board. Yeah. I'll put that link in the show notes too. Great idea. Great idea. And of course, everybody's welcome over at the Mindful Dietitian. Yeah. Tell us about that. I'm, I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes as well, but tell us a little more about what you're doing there. Yeah. So I've had a fairly long journey with mindfulness in the sense that I long is all in perspective, I guess. Maybe about a, 10 years ago or so, I started 
doing my own mindfulness practice. So some of that was informal and some of it was formal. So meditation, in other words. And I wasn't doing it necessarily regularly. And I didn't really have a good thorough understanding about the benefits of it. But what I did notice is it changed the way I was with my clients. It really changed my sense of presence. It changed my how I was able to listen and absorb information and then to be able to sit alongside people and be able to notice, for example, those urges to give advice or the urges to interrupt. And this was the gift that mindfulness taught me, really. And so it was then I progressed on to more mindful eating and intuitive eating. And that's when I started really sinking into that. And I noticed that integrating that with my clients with eating disorders was like, oh, this is awesome. Like it's such an important part of recovery. And so I started integrating that into my practice. And then I noticed that Not a lot of dietitians were doing that in Australia. So, started running workshops and online kind of programs, which are still running. And then I thought, oh, wouldn't it be lovely if we could have a little group of people? Because by then, a lot of people were very interested in mindfulness. Mindful eating has become, and intuitive eating has become so much more widely known. I don't really like the word popular because then it insinuates that it will be unpopular Hopefully, it will never be unpopular, but I noticed a lot of people were just a lot more curious, a lot more interested and wanting to integrate it into their practice. So, I set up the Mindful Dietitian as like a hub, a hub for dietitians and nutritionists to learn, to have opportunities to share, connect and be in a like-minded space. So, yeah, as you know, there's the website and then there's our our awesome, very dynamic and very active Facebook group where I'm very proud to say that, you know, the world's most amazing people, including yourself, are in that group. You know, the people that I admire the most in in health at every size and in mindfulness-based approaches and intuitive eating, you know, they're in this group, which mm-hmm. is just, it's an amazing space to learn. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's so, it's such a great group of people. And I think it's so valuable for anyone who's looking to learn more about Hayes and is a dietitian, right, who wants to practice in this area. And who also anyone who already is a dietitian practicing in this area. Come join us. Yes. It's fun over here. <laughs> it's really fun over here. I, I mean, oh my gosh, I've made such great friends and connections with people in this community. I feel like what you said about the warm blanket is really resonating with me too. It's like a great, great group of people. Yeah. I think for a long time, Chrissy, I'm not sure if you felt this way, but I felt very different. I felt very left of centre and from that I felt a bit isolated and I think that didn't help me with my confidence as a dietitian. Mm -hmm. Same. Yeah, did you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, how did you kind of navigate that? I I mean, I had sort of a winding path, I feel like, with my career because I was a food writer first and that never felt 100%, you know, and I think it was because I went into it with my own disordered eating still going on and sort of looking for the answers, you know, and looking for food writing to help me through a love of food to heal myself, really, which it did get me part of the way there, you know, it got me out of the worst, the worst of it, I think, but certainly did not address the underlying issues and the lingering behaviors and diet mentality that I needed to address through therapy and all of that. And as I was going through my training to become a dietitian, I was also working part-time and then full-time at the city department of health. And I worked on some very valuable and sort of weight neutral initiatives just to bring like more diverse and fresher menus into city facilities, which was awesome. And I felt like very helpful and needed and didn't have a ton of stigmatizing language, although there was certainly some, and I kind of recognized that after the fact. But while doing that work, I definitely still felt like there was something missing. And I felt like what I had learned about people's relationships with food and food culture, both through food writing and through my own experience of recovery was missing from that. And I I just felt like, gosh, all these people are so comfortable, like crunching numbers and making recommendations. And it just was very, it wasn't clinical. It was more policy level type of work, but Mm -hmm. it was, Mm. it had a sort of sterile 
feel to it almost. Like even though people there and, you know, I had great friends that I was working with, like loved food and we all went out to lunches and dinners to celebrate people's birthdays. And it was like this lovely workplace culture. I just was like, eh, there's still something missing here and I don't quite know what it is. And and when I found eating disorder work and then through that, I found my way to health at every size and sort of learned about why weight stigma is not okay for anyone, you know, it's it's why a weight management approach to eating disorder recovery is never going to work. Suddenly kind of a light bulb went off and I was like, oh, this is what felt so off and weird and missing about the work I was doing before was that like there was still this sort of anti-obesity language. And there was this, I mean, some of the grants that were funding our work were from the CDC's obesity prevention initiatives and, you know, stuff like that. So it was very much in this, the obesity epidemic, quote unquote, rhetoric still was infused, even though there was a lot of good and a lot of very like weight neutral and sort of food neutral types of messages going on there too. And it just was very confusing. I think it was like, that was why things weren't sort of clicking and resonating, you know, because I was just like, why are we saying one thing and doing another? Or why are these two things kind of existing side by side? It just felt off to me. And I felt like I would see people were really taking our initiatives and running with them. I and mean, one of my projects was to do nutrition education workshops. And some of the participants that were like, you know, my straight A students who were showing up every week and doing everything and like taking it to the next level, I was like, oh my God, I recognize the sort of obsessive quality that they're Mm -hmm. approaching this Mm -hmm. with as like how I used to be, you know, back in the day with my eating disorder. And I was like, how is this okay? You know, I had that, that disconnect. So I think it just, when I was introduced to the eating disorder work and health at every size as a first was just kind of like a tool for recovery before I learned about the social justice aspects and all of that, just thinking about it as a tool for eating disorder recovery, I was like, yes, this makes so much sense because how can we possibly expect people to recover with all these mixed messages? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of just felt like I had found my tribe because I found people who got that and people who were questioning and pushing back and feeling unsatisfied by traditional dietetics and health education in the same way that I had. So it just, Mm -hmm. I guess the, the sort of questioning and nagging kind of feelings along the way, I feel like have been mostly laid to rest. You know, I just feel like I truly believe in what I'm doing now. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's really cool. It is because I think when you can bring your whole self and that sense of passion and tenacity into the work that you're doing with other people, then that's when you can really get shit done, you know? Mm -hmm. And if we're just bringing part of ourselves into particularly the work that we do, that you and I do, it doesn't really work, does it? You kind of have to be in it with your whole self. And it feels the the reward is huge when you're able to make that investment and also be willing to – what I found really valuable is – that I've become more willing to make mistakes rather than less willing, which is really interesting because traditionally I would not have been keen on making mistakes at all. Whereas now I feel okay about making mistakes because if, if I'm not giving it a good crack, as we call it here, if I'm not giving it a good go, if I'm not putting my heart and soul into it, then I'm going to fall short and it's only when I can go with my full soul and spirit that I'm going to make mistakes and then I'm going to learn. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that actually the willingness to to make mistakes and learn from it is best achieved when you have a trusting community, when you feel connected, when you feel wholeheartedly accepted, when you can wholeheartedly accept yourself as well and acknowledge your humanity and acknowledge our wholeness as we all are. So yeah, it's it's a good space to be. That's for sure. It is. Yeah. I feel like there is so much more space for humanity and true connection in this, this field. Yes, absolutely. Oh, well, it's so good talking with you, Fiona. I could talk with you forever, but I'm mindful of the time because I know we both have our days to 
get on with. (laughs) (laughs) So can you tell us about where people can find you online and your various programs and projects? Yeah, absolutely. Be more than happy to. So if you're a dietitian or nutritionist or a helping professional, then The Mindful Dietitian is www.themindfuldietitian. Remembering that dietitian is spelt D-I-E-T-I-T-I-A-N.com.au because I'm in Australia, (laughs) of course. And then there's a, a closed Facebook group there too, just The Mindful Dietitian. So you can just click, I think, request or, you know, whatever you do to join a group. Mm-hmm. And then you'll be part of this warm blanket awesomeness that is that closed Facebook group. And then I'm also director or co-director, that is, of Body Positive Australia, which is www.bodypositiveaustralia.com. AU. So that is my business that I have with my business partner, Sarah Harry, who is a therapist and amazing yoga teacher. And she's the one who started Fat Yoga in Australia, which is absolutely going off. And yeah, the classes are booked like for the next six months. <gasps> wow. And- that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, we talked about so much stuff, but I've almost finished my yoga teacher training. So <gasps> yes. I. Yes. That's yeah, exciting. So- It is so exciting. So I am teaching, as a student, of course, I'm teaching one of the fat yoga classes in my local area and the participants or my students, they're just amazing. They're an incredible bunch of people who are wanting to move their bodies in a way that helps with their well-being, physical well-being and emotional well-being. And, you know, the best thing about fat yoga is it's providing a space for all bodies providing a space where people in larger bodies have not felt welcome in regular, if you want to call it that, regular studios. So for anybody out there, then, you know, Sarah and Diane Bondi and um, Jessamine Stanley and, oh, my gosh, there's amazing people doing amazing things in the yoga world as well. Yeah, seriously. I feel like the yoga world is is really where it's at in terms of body positive fitness. It's funny. I can't think of anyone as big of a community of a different type of fitness, you know, or well, yoga really isn't just about fitness, but you know, in the, that sort of space that is, is as active and committed and wonderful as the yoga community. Yeah. I think the thing with the yoga community is there's a, well, there's more than two camps, isn't there? There's about 50 different camps, Mm -hmm. depending on your philosophical background and your asana practice and da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's interesting because there's the, you know, there's the yoga community that is very wrapped up in quote unquote health and tied up in that, of course, is the yoga body, which I call it, <laughs> I don't know whether it's really the right thing to say or not, but you know, I don't really mind too much. I call that fake yoga mm. because it's not done in the yoga spirit. It's saying that yoga is to achieve a certain outcome. It's like saying mindfulness is, you know, you use mindful eating, say, for example, for weight loss, which, oh, mm. my God, face God. all over the place. Yeah. So whereas I think a lot of the other fitness, the areas of fitness apart from yoga are still very caught up in achievement and changing the body and, yeah, we're getting there slowly, slowly. Totally. Yoga is leading the way. It's a good thing. Yoga's leading the way. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. So do you have a a yoga aspect of your website or can people find out more about what you're doing there? Yeah. So the yoga side of things is really all Sarah. So on Body Positive Australia, you can find lots of information there about Sarah's classes and what she offers. And yeah, once I get qualified, then, then I'll be deciding how I want to incorporate yoga into my own professional work look to be honest I really can't see myself in a traditional studio that doesn't feel like the right place for me I want to incorporate yoga maybe into my social justice work so I'm thinking maybe specializing in maybe trauma sensitive yoga we have a lot of refugees in Australia and maybe doing some work with that group doing some work in eating disorders yeah that's amazing We'll keep that door open. Yes, yes. Well, I'm excited to hear more about that as it evolves. And depending on when this comes out, I will be linking to all of that. So, Oh, thank you. You are the best, Christy. And thank you so much for having me. I've just loved chatting with you. Yay. Thank you so much. Love chatting with you too. 
So that's our show. Thanks again so much to our guests for being here and to you guys for listening. And we'll be back again next week with another brand new episode. Meanwhile, I'd love to stay in touch. And the best way to do that is via email. So you can go to christyharrison.com slash email to sign up for my VIP list. I'll send you info about new episodes of the podcast as they drop, as well as exclusive sneak previews of new episodes, giveaways and other special deals on the products and services I offer, special tips on how to make peace with food and learn to trust your body, and a whole lot more. Sign up at christyharrison.com slash email. You can also subscribe via iTunes and leave us a nice rating and review, which is a great way to get the word out about the podcast and help other people find these important messages. Just go to iTunes from your computer or your podcast app, type in Food Psych to the search bar, click on the result that comes up under podcasts, and then click on ratings and reviews, and you can leave a rating and review right there. And I really appreciate all the five-star reviews and wonderful ratings that we've gotten because it's helped us climb really high right now in the rankings. And that's really cool because we're competing against some of the weight management and body shaming types of messages that I'm trying to fight with this podcast. So we've really started to beat out a lot of the diety voices, and I'd love to continue climbing higher in the rankings to get this message out even further. So please leave us a nice rating and review. It's so very much appreciated. And thanks to everyone who's left reviews so far. The music you're hearing behind me now is by a band called AWOL, and the track is called Food, used under the Creative Commons license. Thanks so much for listening, and until next time, stay psyched. Stupid or scared, no work in the kitchen now. Who put-